right, so welcome, all of you, everybody on Zoom. I'm Kathy Safarian. Um, I'm a real estate director with the Wendy's Company. Um, hopefully, you guys know who Wendy's. Um, hopefully, you've been to a Wendy's at some point in time. Um, let's see. Two. Oh, there we go. All right. Um, just to give you a little something about me, the screen's a little cut off, but just an introduction and background. Um, I'm an LMU grad, and I graduated way back in 1984. Um, I was in liberal, liberal arts and had a great time at LMU. Um, what did I do? I, um, I played soccer. I was at Del Gamma. I studied abroad in Heidelberg. Um, just made the most of the four years I had here. I had a great time. Um, and, um, I'm, I'm coming out of college. I actually didn't quite know exactly what I was going to do when I did retail for a few years. Actually, I wanted to get a master's. And at that point, my dad was like, get a job and figure out really if you want a master's or what type you want. So did retail for a few years and then jumped in in 1987 to, uh, the real estate corporate side of real estate. So that's going to be, um, a big focus of what we're going to talk about as far as market dynamics analysis is going to primarily come from my perspective in, in how I've built um, many, many hundreds, literally, of restaurants. Um, so just to give you a quick background on the Wendy's company, um, we're based out of Dublin, Ohio, and currently we have 7,000 restaurants, and we have a goal to have 8,500 by um, 2025. So I don't know if we'll be able to be that aggressive based on the way things are going right now with the economy, but that's that's the hope. And so we're pushing real hard. And the Wendy's company was founded by Dave Thomas. Um, and he, uh, it was founded in 1969. He's an amazing guy. He was adopted. He um, actually has, uh, he was a fantastic leader. And there's like five pillars that he kind of, we led by, right? That we still do to this day. That, Quality is our recipe, do the right thing, treat people with respect, profit's not a dirty word, and give back. Um, so it's all kind of things that we, all, as a company, we work towards. Um, and he was also, I, I think I mentioned he was adopted. He's created the biggest um, foundation for adoption in the country. And he's um, placed, uh, that foundation has placed over 10,000 kids in the US and UK um, and Canada. So um, I do have one question, and then Erwin, I don't think you can answer because you might know the answer. But does have you been to Wendy's? I can't I can't see hands on Zoom, but have y'all been to Wendy's? Have you noticed that our burgers are square? Does anybody know why they're square? Because Dave Thomas and his very simple-minded, basic, practical way said, "Well, we don't cut corners." <laughs> so it's a really great foundation to the company, and I love working there. I've been there since for 22 years, so. Obviously, I enjoy being there. I'm married. Um, my husband, oh, I should say I'm also, uh, I have my real estate license and I'm a licensed real estate broker. And I do that for kind of personal business. Um, I don't actually need a real estate license to do what I'm doing within the corporation because the corporation um, is the entity. Um, but, you know, it's great to have kind of the other side of it too with my broker's license. I'm married um, to a gentleman that, um, is also in the restaurant business, and um, he he's been broker and all, primarily on the restaurant side as well. He's done real estate for CPK and um, two of the biggest restaurant companies that own Outback and Fleming's, and um, I could go on and on. Capital Grill. He's he's had a lot. It's a lot of fun on the restaurant side of the business. Um, and uh, I have two children, actually, and two stepchildren. But my two children, um, my daughter graduated from LMU. And I will talk about her um, a little farther along. Um, I've got a new slide that I didn't have at the last seminar. And the slide that I added is called Spotlight on LMU grads that are in this commercial real estate business. So I've got three people that are within the last decade plus graduates, because I feel like maybe that's something you all could really relate to. And they've all offered their contact information. So you, if you have interest at all in this side of the business, um, they're happy to answer questions and kind of talk to you how, how they got there and how they moved up through the industry. Um, and I, my son's somewhere out in Nashville. Um, anyway, 
Uh, let's see. Kathy, can I ask a question? Yes. So of those those fifteen hundred stores that you want to add, yes. Geographically, where do you want to uh, add those stores, and why? So we can kind of touch on you know where we have gaps in the market, um, and we're so we have a mapping system that we'll talk about that we know where our restaurants are, we know where our competitors are, we know where our com competitors do well because we have that information. And um, so we're looking at our goals and we're also looking at non a lot of non-traditional, which is a, actually a big chunk of what that number is. We had a commitment from a, it's called Reef. They're actually property owners that were building trailers that were delivered that were uh, yeah delivery only um so it was like app only so they they're in Canada with us they're a franchisee of ours so they were talking about close to a thousand of those we've looked at dark kitchens we've looked at a lot of so so facilities that you can get in for a much lower cost um so that that's a big chunk of that number so I, I have a feeling it might come down because I think some of these um, delivery only are, are not all that profitable but yet to see. So um, I can tell you that um, I've I've been around the business all my life. I feel like it's in the blood. Um, my father was in the business. My father's dad was a butcher. And my dad had the choice of becoming a butcher in Wilmington. I don't know if you know where Wilmington is, not that sexy, but, um, or he went ahead and got his real estate license. And he opened up an office. He says it was in the loan workshop. It's Sometimes we don't know what stories to believe, but a guy walked into his office one day and said, um, I want help finding a real estate for a restaurant. That I want to do something like McDonald's, but I want to do Mexican style. So he found in the corner. And then the guy's like, I don't know what to call this restaurant. My dad's like, well, your last name is Bell. How about Taco Bell? So he told us that story all these years, but it actually is in Glenn Bell's autobiography. And he has been, they remain friends until Glenn passed away. So he's always been on the side of the business. So when you're you, when you're around it, and when I know you're, you know, you've probably driven around, and it's like, okay, we're, we're we might be going to the movie here, but we got to go see this rent restaurant over here because you're always checking out competition corners, you know, what's happening in your market. So it's kind of in the blood. Same thing with my daughter. I think that's how she got in the business, just being around it. You know, I would. Put her on an airplane and we'd go check out i mean how fun when you're six years old and you can go check out real estate and go you have to go to all these restaurants to analyze them and how much how many customers do they have and so i think it's it's kind of a legacy currently in our family that we enjoy uh, let's see okay um so this is a little bit i mean I don't want to pick on you guys because you're here, <laughs> but we were in just, I was just going to say like, who are you all? And, and, um, you know, do you, have you heard of this side of corporate real estate? Have you, um, thought about, you know, a real estate career, um, any thoughts or anybody in the chat, um, welcome to join at this point or ever, um, once you <laughs> yeah, well, first of all, what uh, what's your name and what year are you? Uh, my name is Hugo. I'm Hugo? a senior uh, finance major. Um, and I, my dad is actually a real estate broker in Florida, South Florida. There you go. Um, it's in the blood. Yeah. And we, uh, you know, sometimes we talk about um, big kind of restaurant chains and McDonald's and, and kind of tell it's more like a real estate company than a restaurant because they own all these. All right. Yeah. Right. So. Um, yeah, that's why I'm interested in this particular uh, session here. But mm -hmm. yeah, I think it was a you know, it's, you know, quite a It is. Yeah. Many facets. You can go in a lot of different areas. Yeah. And your name? Oh, my name is Carolina. Carolina. I'm a senior. I'm a business management major. Mm -hmm. And I just want to do it also. Okay. I just want to why not? Good. Yeah. Perfect. I love it. Nice to have you guys. Um, so, Again, this, you know, the focus here is talking about kind of commercial real estate. And as I mentioned, I, um, I'm i going to talk primarily from a tenant's perspective. Feel free to ask questions anytime as we go. There's a lot of material on these slides, which I hope, I think Hugo passed out. I have, think everybody has the deck so you can follow along because I know there's a lot of information, um, but there's a lot of pieces to what we do. 
Um, and there might be a few common things as we go through the seminar. I might say that I love what I do more than once. So apologies in advance. Um, you're probably also going to hear back in the day because I've been doing this a long time. And, it, you know, it's really amazing for me to see. Yeah, oh, we didn't have cell phones when we when I first started looking at real estate. I'm going to show you some mapping systems. The technology we have now to capture demographics and mapping is amazing. Um, back in the day, we used to go to the auto club and get maps and put little sticky dots. The McDonald's was a yellow. Burger King was an orange. And, you know, so it, I mean, I've been doing it for a while. Um, and it's great to have, it's, it's great to have the tools that we have. So we'll give you a glimpse into the dynamics of, um, of this, this industry. It's just constantly changing and challenging and a lot of fun as well. Um, one of the things that I would uh, preface is that in this business, and I would say any business, you're going to want to, you really want to focus on relationships. Um, how it's so important to be upstanding, be respectful, be communicative, return phone calls, follow up, um, be accountable, be fair, be honest. Um, your successes will depend, your long-term success will depend on all those relationships. Um, one of the reasons I'm here in this room today is because I work with Irwin Busey, who will be up here in the second half to talk about one of his home run shopping centers. Um, but Erwin and I did a deal together when I worked with Brinker. Brinker owns Chili's, Macaroni Grill, Maggiano's Corner Bakery. So I had the West Coast. We did a deal in Torrance, California. And um, we did a great deal, right? Even with that Absolutely. beloved, difficult, challenging landlord. <laughs> who the, This landlord who owns a lot of land and we love him. But he comes to our restaurant and he wants to start redesigning our prototype. So we're a national company rolling this prototype out and by for efficiencies you have to have prototypes that are you, know, you get building plans and you can suddenly all the chain restaurants roll them out you know quickly but he's like well i think this should go over there and that should go over there <laughs> can't happen but he liked the statement so we got the deal done Erwin and i have remained made friends over the years and we're working on more deals in the future i hope um so in the long run if you work towards win-win deals and work with integrity that you'll be better off for it. Um, you'll you'll um, develop multi-year relationships. You know, you're tied to these relationships when you're in a lease or even when you buy a property in a shopping center because things come up. You're going to have issues with, you know, you someone with a common area or, you know, so there's, it's just keep those relationships strong and then you'll, and you'll end up with um, not only solid business relationships, but ultimately friendships um, at in many cases, I would say. So again, there's a lot of information we're gonna go through and we're gonna, um, it's gonna be a combination of beginning with, how do you how do you roll a concept out in a market? We're gonna talk about strategic market planning and site selection. We're gonna define a trade area. We're gonna talk about tenant categories. And we're gonna go through um, a couple different tenants site criteria. And a site criteria is, you know, what are we looking for when we're going to develop a site? How much land do we need? Um, what are their specifications? So we'll show, show you a few of those. Um, we're gonna talk quite a bit about demographics and infographics. Um, so the GIS tools that we have, talk a little bit about strategic development plan, mobility data, um, and, and also how mobility data helps us with potential impact. So when we're deciding where to build either stores or restaurants, we now have the technology where um, customer cell phones are tracking their trips to and from. So we have that information that helps us determine, you know, how close can we build restaurants to each other. Uh, we'll talk about some shopping center classifications um, and physical site characteristics. And we're gonna, and, and that should be the first half. And then in the second half, we're gonna have Erwin come up and we're gonna talk about an, a really great shopping center in Woodland Hills called the Topeka Village Plaza. And we'll talk a little bit about the history and how Erwin found the site and how they developed it. And then again, I mentioned, we're gonna have a spotlight on three alum. Uh, we'll talk about a little bit about market fluctuations and what's happening now and how the economy and how you know, COVID and the economy changed 
traffic patterns and customer patterns and, and what companies do to address that. Um, and I have, um, I have some, I've outlined briefly in the deck the, the basics of a letter of intent. And then there's actually, you should have received, or if you haven't, you can receive um, a sample letter of intent, which is essentially how you cut your deal from the start. I mean, it's it's not a binding um, legal document, but it's basically, it outlines the parameters of what type of deal you're gonna cut. Um, and then I got just a page that talks about how many different types of careers there are in the real estate industry. Because I'm talking from the perspective of being on the tenant side, um, Irwin's on the developer side, there's brokers there. So it goes on and on the different, um, di different opportunities in real estate. So starting um, with this, and um, I guess we can't see the top of the page, but the top of the page, um, if you have your deck, um, everybody on Zoom in front of you, you might be able to see the top of the page is titled, Site selection is neither an art nor, uh, wait, it's neither a science nor an art, either way. Um, it's rather a combination of both. Um, and that comes from an author of a book that I'm gonna recommend it's on, it's in the deck, his name and information. It's called the ABCs of Site Selection, but it's kind of a given. I mean, it's, so it's, it's you can't have one without the other. You can't just go off of the demographic report and expect that you're going to say, okay, this is where we need to be. It's so here I've kind of outlined, you know, the science side is your GIS. It's your mapping and demographics and, and lifestyle segmentations we'll touch on, but that's actually infographics. Um, it's, you, it's your traffic counts and your competitor locations and sales volume. It's your mobility data. It's your, your forecasting and performance. Those are all the numbers that you can get your hands on and you can calculate and you can assess with hard numbers, essentially. The art is what you can't buy. And the art is sort of what the veterans in the industry or the people in the industry, that's what where your value comes in because it's your historical knowledge of a market. You know, you're, you're you know, um, I mean, I've been, I've been working the West Coast for many, many years. And so I, I can tell you, you know, how traders have shifted. I can tell you who used to be there and where the area is growing. Um, and that's over a big, huge, tremendous amount of territory. Um, for example, I came to Wendy's in 2000. They didn't have any company restaurants at the time. They had a few franchise restaurants. They had been here in the 80s. They left in the 80s because they couldn't compete. Um, by 2000, they said, we're growing. We got to come to California. We're going to tip our toe in there. And so for me to come to them and they're like, wow, somebody that knows, you know, that has been with the restaurants and QSRs out this way. So we went from probably eight restaurants. There's now 135 just in LA, just in the LA. Too. So my, my history in the market helped them tremendously. Um, and then there's, we'll talk a little bit about, you know, your gut instinct, your inner computer is what we kind of call it. There's sometimes I'll get a set up on a site and I'm like, oh gosh, we're not there. I want to be there. I'm going to go look at a site and I'm excited about it on paper. And you go out there and you're like, mm. and it's when your gut sinks. It's kind of like, maybe like when you go on a date, you're set up on a date. And it's like you're had all these high hopes and then you have nothing to talk about with the person. So, um, so your, your inner computer. Um, and also it's the feel. So same kind of thing. Um, the condition of the property, you, you've got to see what's happening. You've got to see, um, you know, I talk about, um, you know, one of the trips I took with my daughter and she was very young and we're driving these neighborhoods. And she's like, well, what are we doing? Like, why are we driving around all these neighborhoods? And I said, well, we're, we're checking to see if these homes, do these homes have lawns? Are they well kept up? Or, you know, are cars parked on, on the lot and is it gravel or, you know, just how, what's the upkeep and what kind of cars are they driving? And so she's like, isn't that kind of like spying on people? Yeah, actually it is. <laughs> and that's kind of what we're doing. I mean, when we get into the tapestry and you look at how deep they go into the types of, um, how they break out the segments of people, it's amazing. And that's what we want to and we need to know 
when we have a business, we know our customer. You know, a Nordstrom needs a certain type of customer. Um, Starbucks can take can almost go anywhere because everybody loves Starbucks. But um, yeah, so you need to know your customer. Um, again, I had put you know products on the store shelves. Um, there's ethnic markets that you know. So are you is your customer ethnic? If you you can kind of tell what type of meats they're serving. It's kind of crazy. I've been with vice presidents. I've been with chairmen of companies that have walked literally walked into the grocery store and went to the meat section and picked up to check out what type of meat they have. Um, so, um, and then the other thing that's an art, because it really is, is your relationships within the industry. Um, how well do you know your landlords, your brokers, um, and your peers? Peers are important as well. I'm very, I'm close with many, many people in many either competitive segments or, you know, we compare notes. You know, are you going here? Are we going to go together? How are you doing there? So it's all it's all part of the art. Um, so this is the definition or a couple definitions of a trade area. I don't know if any of you have ever really heard that phrase trade area, but it's essentially it kind of, you know, makes sense. It's where you're going to trade. Um, and it's kind of a long definition in the sense of what's written there, but in relation to the commercial um, end of it, it's, it's kind of the reach. How far will your customers come? Um, we know we have a certain drive time. Um, and so that's kind of how we calculate the number of people in that area. Um, so for example, um, here they're showing a trade area for expensive furniture is much larger than gasoline, right? And especially today, even more so, right? Um, so it depends on the product. And it depends on the competitors because they can choose a competitor um, over you if they're more convenient or closer. So I don't want to read through the whole entire definition, but I think that, that that little illustration is helpful. So your typical trade area, like in LA, is that a two mile ring? Is that a so ring? Is it a it's more of a driving distance these days. Yeah. Um, and we'll talk about nowadays we run demographics. We run our reports. We have the option of doing it on a ring, a radius. Um, so we'll usually do a one, two, and five. And then we do drive times. Um, we can also do walk times because we're looking more at some urban locations. So, you know, five is a stretch. Um, five miles is a stretch, but then drive time would be under 10 minutes, probably eight. Yeah. And this I included because I think it's just kind of good for you to see. Um, I forgot this is double sided. Um, these are just different categories of different retailers, different um, kind of the either lingo or, you know, when, when we're building a shopping center and we want to get kind of a combination of who's going to be in that shopping center. Because you're obviously not going to put two grocery stores and three grocery stores in the same center and two burgers or three chicken guys. You've got to get a tenant mix. Um, so, you know, it goes from everywhere from, you know, you consider Nordstrom and Bloomingdale's and Saks kind of your upscale department store. You've got your value oriented national chains like Kohl's and JCPenney. Um, off price would be like your Ross and Burlington's and TJ Maxx. Hypermarkets, we call like our Walmarts and Targets. And then you've got the clubs, the warehouse clubs, wholesale clubs, the Costco's and the Sam clubs. Um, home improvement, obviously Home Depot and Lowe's. Um, grocery anchors, we call them, we kind of refer to them as daily needs. So we like being in grocery anchor shopping centers because people come more frequently to shop at grocery stores. Um, so you obviously everybody knows what grocery store is. Um, but actually, we added one to the category, which is Amazon grocery. <laughs> um, your drug stores, your entertainment centers with the movie theaters, and, and entertainment centers have kind of blown up with your top golfs, and you know, you'd have your Dave Investors and that type of tenant. Your fitness tenants with LA Fitness, Soul Cycle, Orange Theory, wellness tenants um, with your cryo labs, your stretch, stretch labs, your massage envies, specialties with the Ulta and Sephora. White. So then getting into the restaurant category, we talk about white tablecloth as your more high-end with your um, Capital Grills, Morton's, Ruth's Chris, Water Grill, and, um, fast casual, oh well, casual dining, which is your Chili's, Olive Garden, CPK, 
Um, and I know you've all been to all these, but fast. And then there's kind of a segment that's kind of your fast casual, which is the Panera's Shake Shacks. Um, so it's not technically fast food, but they're quick, um, fast casual, Mendo. And then fast food, we like to call ourselves QSRs, um, quick service restaurants, because it sounds better than fast food. Um, so obviously your in and outs your Chick-fil-A, your Wendy's. Your coffee segment, your convenience stores, gas stations, and it goes on and on. So these are all just just so you have it on hand as you look at the shopping center industry and kind of get a feel for tenancy and tenant mix. Um, so one thing that I want you to think about is that all of these tenants have, I, I'm not going to say all of them, but most of them have in-house real estate departments. But if not, they have sources that maybe they use brokers for their real estate because these tenants need to deal with real estate on a day in, day out basis, whether they're growing or whether they're looking at existing assets and, hey, is our lease coming up? Hey, do we still want to stay in this location? Hey, do we need to relocate? And it's kind of funny because as much as I was around, um, my I knew what my dad did. He got into uh, running a corporation for a while out of real estate, but then back into real estate. But I never really knew the niche that there was within these uh, this segment. So I think that that's kind of, hopefully I'm able to kind of give you a visual and also give you some contacts of, um, of people that are willing to talk to you about, you know, what they do and how, you know, kind of what's your day-to-day, -day, how'd you get to this position? And it's... Um, it, and, it, and by the way, it's not just real estate people in house. Typically, you're, you're going to typically have a construction department. You're going to have a legal department. You're going to have an asset management department. Asset management is a whole group that's just um, watching over existing facilities and leases. So, just something I wanted to make sure that you were aware of when you start thinking about um, how these how we grow in a market. And. For any of these tenants to grow, they have to know who their customer is. Um, so it's there, there's a lot that goes into it, um, and it's kind of a combination of efforts. Um, you can you know survey your existing customers. You know where your successful restaurants are. You can run demographic reports and do kind of a like for like on your more successful restaurants. But so. The majority of tenants will have something. If you call them, if you have a piece of property and you say, I've got three acres and it's a, a freeway off ramp and I want to build a few QSRs, a few casual uh, quick service restaurants. Do I have enough land? First of all, you'd want to know if they're in the market. Um, if they're not, you'd want to know what's their, what are their requirements? So as a tenant, we typically have um, what we call a site criteria. And these are something that we create uh, internally and hand out. It's public knowledge. And we want people to be aware of this because we want to look at sites that are viable. Um, we go through a lot of, I go through a lot of sites that are submitted that can't even come close to accommodating our use because they're just not within our parameters. So um, usually they'll give a little explanation of their company. So obviously we have Panera here. And they're looking at a, at a one and two um, mile, so you can see in the demo guidelines. So they're looking, they're saying we need 10,000 or more people in a mile and 30,000 more in two miles. And so that's typically residential population. And then it breaks down to um, daytime population. That's the people that are there during the day. Um, some of the people, some of the residents may have left for the day to go to work outside of that trade area. Um, and we actually break it down to um, daytime employment, the people that are coming into the trade area that um, are the employees. And we like those because those are the ones that are going to be coming in for lunch. So they're breaking down, we, you know, they know their range of what do these people need to be making, what's their median income, and able to, to be able to afford our product on a regular basis. So they're looking at 50,000 or more. Um, and then do they have a bachelor's degree? Um, what percentage they like to see. And then we must, we all look for traffic counts. We like to see high vehicular traffic through on one or two streets. 
Um, and then they've gone down to identify um, who are their preferred co-tenants. So they've said big box um, and then regional anchor tenants. Um, so not everybody has preferred co-tenants on there. We're not as demanding as a, as a fast food tenant. We'll take hard corners and on our own. Um, I'm sure they will as well. But so the, and then they've gone on to identify their shell. Their shell is their building. Um, so if they're saying we want you, um, we, we're going to need this much electrical, and we're going to need this these hookups: gas, water, telephone, fire, etc. So, um, and then there's space parameters. So they're looking for drive-throughs, as most of you, I'm sure, know. Many years ago, they started, they never had drive-throughs before. Now, everybody wants drive-throughs. So that kind of makes uh, my business a little more challenging. Um, so they can go freestanding or in cap. So basically a summary. And then they've gone on to um, identify the deal type and terms. So, that would be, do they want to buy? Do they want to lease? And so they give you the parameters of that. So that's a really helpful one. Um, a lot of times they'll include prototypes of their building, but if, you know, this is, is if you've got a property and you've got, you're wanting to talk to a tenant, this is a great way to get a, a good amount of information. Um, I've included in and outside criteria. Um, they're a little different. They take a lot more land and look at how simple theirs is because they don't need to say much because everybody knows who in and out is <laughs> and everybody wants in and out on their property, right? Um, I could be working on it. I, there's a deal in Las Vegas that our, we worked on for like two years at Costco on St. Rose Parkway. Awesome deal. And can never get it over the finish line. And then in and out walks in and like, boom, we're gone. <laughs> so um, it's just, they're unique. Right, and they're a draw, and they're kind of a pride of ownership for landlords. I mean, the the one thing that they do is they take a lot of land because they have a huge, huge staffing. requirement for staffing, huge. So they talk right away. They want to know how much they want to identify how much traffic. That's very important to them. And then how many in the trade area? Their median income's a little lower. They just give the basics, like boom, 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 simple, um, and. So purchase or lease with an option to purchase, which is always interesting. So there's in and outs. Um, and here's what we do with Wendy's. Um, so we have a site criteria. We we have this in two pages or one, but um, it's it's very similar. Um, resident, we identify residential population, we identify daytime and median income. It's all, you know, most tenants you'll see, we want a prominent, visible, a um, a site's preferred. I mean, who's going to come in and say, <laughs> I prefer C site. Um, but, um, and then parking, you know, so we go through it and then we go, we've identified multiple location types and that's somewhat newer. Um, several years ago, we really just did freestanding drive throughs um, So beyond that, we've had a lot of success with end cap drive throughs So end caps are when you're part of a building and there's other tenants. So it's a great deal for a landlord because if we want to go on an A quarter, but we don't want to pay the A price, if he has a building that has a couple more tenants, say a cell phone guy, or it could even be, I'm in one with Chipotle on one, and I'm in one with Jimmy John's, and then, but we get the drive. And you see them with Starbucks all the time, but that's what an end cap is. is. We love conversions. We love to take old buildings. Um, we like to do um, QSRs with the drive through but we've even taken... Uh, we take many banks. We've even taken a Payless shoe store and converted it to a Wendy's using the structure and then just building the drive through So we can get very creative. We do airports. We do college universities. We do travel plazas. Those are the big truck stops you see on the side of the interstates. Um, hospitals, military bases, office buildings, entertainment venues. The one service station co-brands. I don't know if you guys ever get on and off at Maltahara. Um, but that Wendy's there is what we call a co-brand. Um, it's there with Shell gas station. Um, um, small towns and, and delivery only units, which is what we talked about real briefly. Um, there's uh, there's a thing called ghost kitchens, dark kitchens, and um, the founder of Uber has cloud kitchens. Kitchen United, I think, just got a ton of money. We've met with both groups. We've tried them. So it's where... Um, you, they have a building where they have multiple kitchens and it can be inside a building where nobody sees them. They just need somewhere for the delivery drivers to come up and pick up. 
So they call them dark kitchens um, because nobody sees them or cloud kitchens. Um, but it's a way to get into a market with a very low cost, but you can get your product out there and, you know, you turn on your delivery app and it's like, wait, there's a Wendy's, there's a Chick-fil-A. And, but you're in an urban area where you, have, you don't even see one of those units. It's because they're probably coming from a dark kitchen. So, and then this is just an example. We actually threw our real estate map up there. So um, currently I'm covering Southern California, Nevada, I'm, I've got the Vegas area, I've got uh, Arizona, Alaska, and Hawaii. Hey, Hawaii's tough. I'm actually jumping on a plane on Sunday to go for a week to go look at sites. So um, we do really well in Hawaii, by the way. There's people that they, they like our burgers. It's good territory. I know. <laughs> I know. It's kind of a perk. I'm not going to lie. Um, all right. So I hope that you can see on the, on the top of this slide, um, we're, we're just taking a look here um, at a GIS report. So these numbers, they're, it's data driven. It's a data driven approach to validate our assumptions, right? So it's global data from over 130 countries with 15,000 variables run by radius rings, drive time, and walk time. So we're looking at, you know, population, median age, and growth rate. Growth rate's always important. Um, I should mention, I'm pretty sure, all the reports that we're gonna go through, um, I, I ran them at the intersection of the shopping center that we're gonna be talking about um, in Woodland Hills. Um, so Irwin Center that we talk about. So, so this is a one, two, and a five mile ring from Topanga and Irwin. Um, that's still practicing. Because the cross street at the shopping center that Irwin developed is Irwin Avenue. And it's not because it was- We bought it with him. Yeah. He doesn't have that much clouds. Yeah. Um, then, of course, we look at, you know, education level. Um, you, just depending on the tenant, you know, it, it's going to be your Apple store is going to want maybe a higher education level versus a QSR. We're not that big. We, we want hungry, um, hungry people and um, with a little bit of money. Um, then we break down race and ethnicity. Uh, we break down median household income, and we look at employment. Um, so, so there's daytime employment, as I mentioned, and then workers. So look at the amount of workers in just one mile. Urban. That's 28,000 people um, that are working in that trade area in a mile. And that's on top of um, the 27,800 that live just within a mile. Not that many, not as many people live there because it's all shopping center and office, but um, but it'll be fun to see when you get to see the shopping center. Um, this is an incredibly dense, what we call a dense trade area. It's got everything going for it. It's got your your residential population, your office population, and your retail. Look at the uh, the other one, population density per square mile. So it's like within a one mile, it's 15, and then you go out to five miles, it's 5,208. I mean, so what it's basically saying is there's a ton of uh, daytime pop right in that game of trade. Right, right. Yep. Um, this is um, what we, we run this report that gives us um, kind of our closest generators. So the people that work at, it tells you how many employees are at each of these businesses. So it's telling who's there, what street they're on, how, how many employees, and how far. And for me, like I give these to my marketing people when they open the restaurant, like this is who you want to go coupon or go talk to. Um, and so you can see, obviously, who's got 1,500. Farmers Insurance has 1,500 employees, just two tenths of a mile away. So um, it's it's a great tool to be able to help you see who's in that trade area. It's not big. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, there we go. Okay, this is the fun part for us. Um, we many um, competitors subscribe to something called Restaurant Trends. So. Um, 
this will tell me you know, competitors within the area that we've run. Um, so see, there it is, Irwin Street, um, McDonald's, and the TR means it's a traditional, that means it's a, it has a drive through You may see some that say NT, and that would be non-traditional. So that means they're in a Walmart or they don't have a drive through um, So this is very valuable to us. Um, and the thing that is amazing is that we talk about tools and I can sit here, I can sit at my office at my desk on this computer and I can run one of these reports within a few minutes, or I can just go into the map and I can click onto any of these competitors. But when I'm in the field, I have an app that has the same mapping system. So I can, like I said, when I started, we didn't have cell phones, we had autofill maps. Well, now I can just open this app and I can, I can, Pull any of this information when I'm right there. So if you're driving and you're, you know, usually we have to get the site approved by operations or our top, you know, echelon. Well, what does that McDonald's do? Well, what is that, you know, so you can, it's right there at our fingertips. It's, it's amazing. So very, very valuable information for us. And this is how you'll see it kind of, um, this is actually based on, I believe it's three minutes, three. 3.3 minute drive time. Um, and this is this this is the same uh, an overview of the same competitors, but within a three minute drive time. So just seeing it mapping wise. Um, and this is when we jump into infographics. Um, let's see. So the difference between um, demographics, again, I mentioned, and infographics is this is when they go into describing a customer. So it's very detailed descriptions, and they have 67 categories. And this is the system we use. This is actually called Esri. On your deck, um, and don't go there now, but on your deck at the back, when I show my references, there should be a link that you should be able to click on and you can jump into their system and you can play with this exercise and see how this mapping system works. But um, they, this group, um, and there's competitors that do the same thing, but these guys use 67 categories um, and it, it describes lifestyles and life stages. So you could also go online and pull down a hundred page um, document that's a template that describes every single category. And I'm kind of convinced that these guys um, are, they may be related to the Ben and Jerry's ice cream guys that name ice creams because some of the names that they come up with are quite interesting. And just as example, I've got this one real estate director, or she's a VP with one of my franchisees that I've worked with for a long time. And um, she was describing an area in Southwest Las Vegas. And she's like, well, you know, it's just a bunch of millionaires and methods. And that's kind of how it's, it's Pahrump, by the way, which is um, Southeast Las Vegas, um, but it's true. It, so you, you know, these guys go in and, and we'll go through this description a little bit. Um, but so you go into, it, it, it it takes everything from, and again, this is the this is the same bubble of the three point three minutes. Um, how much high school? Um, some college, and then it goes into income, white collar, blue collar services, and then breaks out the key facts: um, population, median age, and then it gets a little more descriptive. So. This is this is kind of what I read off to you. So tapestry segmentation, 67 unique segments based on demographics and socioeconomic characteristics. Um, it helps identify the customer for development and also gives a vision for marketing strategy. So this is where it gets, these are, here's a few different um, segments. So they've got affluent estates, upscale avenues, Uptown individuals, family landscapes, Gen X. I mean, they're all, you can kind of figure out who these people are. Cozy country living, sprouting explorers, middle ground, senior styles, rustic outposts, midtown singles, hometown, 
and next wave. So I think we pulled a slide of the upscale avenues um, based on that being the highest number within this trade area. Um, so this is this is it's kind of this is kind of the same information just displayed a little differently, right? But because well, no, maybe we did enterprising professionals. It's forty six percent. So I think on the next page, who are we? They're well educated, climbing the ladder. Uh, they, I guess, science, technology, engineering, mathematical occupations, change jobs often. She used to live in condos, townhomes, apartments. Does that sound like your trade area? Um, fast growing, um, diverse neighborhoods of large metro areas. Uh, so it just gets very, like really digs deep into kind of, you know, who that customer is. And it's important to know based on your tenant mix, right? Um, so we'll jump to the next. And this actually breaks it down even more um, into race, ethnicity, income, net worth, occupation by earning. You could dive into these reports um, and it's been a lot, a lot of time, but we know, you know, generally the basics. We look at both, but we know the basics of what we need for our customers. So we don't spend too much time, but it's fascinating to know what's out there when you really want to dig in. Um, and this is just a little bit more. So these guys, they buy digital books, but they also buy magazines and newspapers. They frequent the dry cleaner. They travel to foreign domestic destinations. Um, you know, so it's kind of, it's fun to see all the different types and what they do. Um, they have health insurance and a 401k through work. These are good customers. They're gonna pay their bills. So now we'll dig in a little bit to, you've got the background of the reports that we pull, probably too much information. Um, but how do you go into a market? How do you, you know, how do you even start if you're just going to a market and decide where you want to go? And one of the things that um, I've mentioned before, I don't know if anybody knows, you guys ever heard of location, location, location? It's, it's people say it's a residential business. Um, we say it often in our business. Um, you, it's kind of like taking the macro to the micro. When you're starting to decide on a, a, a location, for instance, when I started with Wendy's, they said, we want you to work right now just Southern California. And we want to, so that's the first you know area. And then you dig down into the community. That's the second location. And then you dig into the third location, which is the micro, which is the actual intersection or end site. So, we have we have this for the entire country, and I believe we have it internationally as well. Um, it shows where our Wendy's are. You can see the little cameo. Um, I can click onto any of those, and it will tell me the address, the owner, the year it opened, the sales, um, the trends. There's a tremendous amount of information, and then from there we have a system that creates where's our gas where do we not have restaurants and but by the way where do we not have restaurants but we know there's retail and synergy and competitors that are doing well so and not going to lie mcdonald's is kind of a gauge of you know how we know where there's higher volume restaurants because we have that information so we've created these we call them potential trade areas um if I had this live, I would click into each of these circles and this would be, there would be a number assigned to it. Every real estate director across the country, and there's about 12 of us, has gone into every single one of these potential trade areas and they've described the trade area, they've described um, the, who is the candidate, is it gonna be a company restaurant or if it's a franchisee who, and then you put you know three different three different potential developers for that, um, and then mine tend to have a red circle around most of them because the red circle means is there a roadblock? What's your roadblock? My roadblock is site availability and affordability. 
So you'll see with your German unit of this market, and you can see some of where some of the dots are. And I could work for years and years and years to try to get into some of those trade areas. Um, very difficult. But, um, and what we've identified here with what we've done is um, the blue star for us is where we have what we call a real estate letter. That's the first stage of somebody registering a site. So we have multiple franchisees growing in a market. So we require them to register this as a site where they can, they can be the only one to look in that trade area for six months. Um, and then we'll extend it if they truly are working and have a site. And then our gold stars are where, um, that's where it's an actual approved site. Um, and then we've got green stars that are under construction actually. So approved is under a letter of intent or approved? Uh, please, please, please okay. approve. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's got it's got our full corporate approval. Yeah. yeah. So that's kind of how we we go because you know you you just have to have a method to madness. You you've got all your reports, all your information, but how are you going to profitably grow in a market? You you've got to be. You're talking about some big big investments here. With um, by the time you build, you know, build the building and staff it and run it multi-million dollar investment so we've got to be really careful and it's a high risk unless you know you've got to do your homework so that's an example of kind of a strategic um plan so can i ask a question uh -huh. so your analysis period in terms of uh your your investment and that return on your investment is that a 10-year model or is that longer or we do 20. you do 20 years uh -huh. okay based on building got it yeah yeah um and what's what's the hurdle rate right, for something that makes sense we're at probably about 13 oh. percent yeah yeah um so this is an example um that is covered up there. this is an example of seeing um mobility data outlined on a map so this is Tango. We use Tango for our what we call cannibalization studies. Um, that's where we we take a restaurant and we determine where our customers are coming from and going to. And when we go to develop a new site, we can do an impact study if we want to determine what we think there, you know, how much impact may occur if we build a restaurant say within two or three miles. So. Mobility data, IDs, customer types, and patterns. Um, it sees our location gaps, analyzes relocations. As it actually can estimate sales impact and cannibal well, impact cannibalization. It uses trillions of data points worldwide to determine trip patterns and points of origin. It's this is interesting. It's sourced directly and anonymously from customers' mobile devices. It tracks the devices. Um, within restaurants to and it goes out to within 10 feet of accuracy over 12 months so it's pretty specific um it it shows pre and post visits um and it, it identifies it identifies itself most likely home or work and i can tell you back in the day when we didn't have this technology um when i were we used to go we call them pin studies and Cheryl Fry, who works at El Fuego Loco, just brought this up the other day. And I actually had to do some of these in person when I was at Carl's Jr., just kind of getting into the business. I was a real estate coordinator, and they said, you know, you have to go to create a package, number one. I used to have to go to the market, sit in the intersection, count cars at morning, noon, and night, and I have to go to every comp competitor. And I would count how many customers are in the drive through and how many customers are in the dining room. And yeah, so this is like how we used to look at things before we had this technology. Now, in relation to cannibalization studies, we would go into restaurants and we'd have a map and we call them pin studies because they literally, we'd say, where do you live? And they didn't have to put their exact house, but the area, put a pin there and where are you going? They might be going back home or they might be going shopping over here. So all of a sudden, like if I had this same auto club map, at a restaurant and we're asking these customers and they're like, well, I live, I live here, but I'm going there. And I 
So this is essentially the same thing, but in modern times, not prehistoric times. <laughs> um, so it's it's very very valuable information for us. Um, it's uh, yeah, and again, I can on my app, I can pull this up. I can look at my restaurants, and I can just click on. They have different types of you know what type of customers they are. If you're going to see them on, uh, they have different colors of the blobs. So um, if, if you've got a restaurant on an interstate, you're going to see a stretch along the interstate because most of your customers are going up, you know, up and down the highway. So those are called regional runners. Or you're going to be in more of a neighborhood area and you're going to have like your soccer mom, you know, kind of close to home trade area. So all kinds of definitions for, for um, all the different trip patterns. Um, here we did, um, I just included this slide because I thought it would be interesting for you all to have on hand to kind of get an understanding of the different types of shopping centers. Um, and this is something that's provided, um, I pulled this off of ICFC, which historically has been um, the International Council of Shopping Centers. What's it called now? <laughs> Somebody changed the name during COVID. Community Survey. Innovation. Innovation Community Survey. Innovation Services Community. Uh, we can look it up, but we are still going to call it International Council of Shopping Centers because that's what it technically is. Um, and oh, I do have that as a reference point. Um, and I, I do want to mention um, it's one of the biggest shopping center industries. Um, that we can't on conventions with them and information, um, they have classes. And what's super interesting for younger, for students as well, they have a student program um, and they have, uh, you can get into conventions for a better rate. And if you are in the shopping center industry, and I'll talk about this a little bit with the next gen uh, people that we're gonna talk about, is that um, they, have a, they have a next gen group. So it's for kind of the new, new people, in the industry and somebody to talk to rather than going into a convention and seeing all these old people that have been doing it for years you can relate to kind of the next gen uh, a little bit better so this is they provide all kinds of information about shopping centers because that's what they track um so we've got a super regional mall which would be considered over 800 000 square feet so it kind of gives a breakdown of the type and the concept and square footage, how many acres they typically take, how many anchors they usually would have, um, and just the typical tenants and type of acres, trade areas. Yeah. And what so they're talking here about what kind of trade area do they need for a regional shopping center? So you can see it's gone out to 25 miles for regional. And again, regional is kind of your big box. Um, but that's super regional. Regional mall is more 15 miles. Um, then you've got community shopping centers, um, and they're a little more about six miles out, I'd say. Um, neighborhood, which is kind of your grocery anchored center, strip convenience. This is all kind of lingo that if you get in the business, um, this is just stuff that you kind of have to know intuitively. So it's nice to have it, you know, how do you know what the difference is? You know, why are they calling it super regional versus regional? Um, why are they calling it a strip center versus an anchor center? So, um, and then they break it down in these, I don't want to say relatively new, but newer um, specialized purpose centers, which are what we call power centers. Um, those are the dominant anchors um, and um, kind of like your big Walmarts and Costco's. And, and then we've got our lifestyle centers, which are kind of the more open air, um, what would you say the closest lifestyle center is? Oh, God, let's see. There's uh, uh, San Clemente, I would you know, San that's Clemente, good. the outlets there. Mm -hmm. Well, that's really Or cool. like um, Calabasas, like Caruso yeah. Center, uh, yeah. open air, um, walk around. And then you've got your factory outlets, your theme slash festival type, touristy type shopping centers, and your uh, limited purpose, which is airport retail. So um, I thought that would be a handy tool to have. Um, and this is actually a really old page out of a book. 
um, from one of the shopping center conventions. And we talked about, you know, if you're the owner of the shopping center or you're a tenant of the shopping center. So here's an example, and if you can kind of see it, the top left is a typical shopping center. It has a good balance of anchor tenants um, and inline tenants and maybe a pad. It's got good parking and it's got some landscaping, right? So it looks good. So then the joke is that um, a major tenant wants to come in and they want to come into the center and they don't want anybody blocking their visibility. They want all the visibility, they want all the parking going right to their front door. And they look, they have like one pad on the front with just a few trees and just in front of that pad and nowhere else. So that's their vision of how they want a shopping center built. And here's a shopping center that Irwin would like to see where it's, you've got a pad everywhere, as many pads as you can get, you wanna get your income up and just, you know, pat it to death um, with minimal parking and zero, <laughs> zero landscape. Um, and then here's the city designer's vision of shopping center. It's basically a park. And that's what they try to get us to do or get, you know, developers to do most of the time. And it's frustrating. Because of course you want, you know, they want to protect and beautify the city. Um, we want to do business. And it, it gets difficult when, you know, you pay all this money for this beautiful building and these signs, and then they, they demand a certain type of landscaping. At a certain point in time, those trees come up and block everything. So it's a constant battle, um, but just something that we deal with. And that's why I thought this would be kind of good for you to see. Um, we, so we talked a little bit already about the shopping center. Um, we didn't talk too much about freestanding sites. Um, so we, what I look at, um, I like, I like to be on a hard corner and you can all imagine what a hard corner is, right? It's the, the corner. And we typically like to be at a signalized intersection. And then when you talk about an intersection, is there, what's the near corner and what's the far corner? So if you're going through an intersection and you stop at the stoplight, you're on the near corner. And the corner that you see beyond you is the far corner. And there, it depends on the tenant. If it, it, there's the going to work side and, and the going home side. So depending on the tenant, Starbucks is want, gonna wanna be on the going to work side, right? Um, somebody like, if anybody goes to Kentucky Fried Chicken or you know, somebody that has more of a lunch dinner menu, they're gonna wanna be on the going home side. Um, and then there's there's off corner, which kind of speaks for itself. And then there's mid block. Um, so that's when you're not on or off, but you're kind of in the middle of the block, not a very desirable uh, spot typically, um, but sometimes you gotta do it because that's the only way to get into the trade area. Um, so factors to consider as you're looking in a trade area, what's the focal point? Where are people going? Um, you know, is we look for we look for retail, residential, and employment, daytime employment. And typically, like, we want to see all three of those, and then we know we've got a home run location. Um, so wh where's the synergy? And you can kind of sense what that means. It's kind of like, where, is, where are all the cars? Where's everybody shopping? Where's the hustle and bustle? Um, and we, you know, is it a signalized intersection? That makes a big difference. Do you have controlled, um, does it control the traffic? If you're mid block and you don't have a signal and you've got, a, even though you have heavy traffic counts, they typically will just fly right by you. Um, so having um, a signal, um, a stop sign, or maybe there's a future signal is good. Um, you've got to think about your left, is a left turn permitted? Um, do you have a left arrow? Is a U-turn permitted? Um, is it the going to work side, going to home side? Um, have left turn twice. And then there's something called a protected left. So a protected left would be when there's a solid median, which is the, the concrete down the center of the road. Sometimes it's just a, a curve. Sometimes it's a beautifully landscaped median. Um, do they provide for a, a left turn in uh, through that median? So that would be a protected left. Um, then there's something that we call a suicide lane, which um, that's when there's no median and it's just striped, but you you know that you can turn and you can be in that in that area, but it's open to both ways of traffic, right? So it's kind of a game of chicken if you get in there and there's another car coming. So that's what we call a suicide lane. 
kind of an open uh, medium. So physical characteristics, um, extremely important. Um, and we, we look long and hard and assess not only the way it is today, but is it gonna be that way in the future as the area develops? Um, so you need to look at and be familiar with access. Can you easily enter and exit the property? Entering would be ingress and exiting would be egress. Um, and then do you have, as far as access, do you have cross access um, with other tenants? So uh, if you're in a shopping center or if you're a pet on the corner and there's a shopping center behind you, you want to hopefully be able to have cross access so you can use their driveways. Um, that's typical if you're part of a shopping center. You've got to be careful about parking. Do you have cross parking? Um, so the cross access, we just kind of talk about it in about is how is this how does the site flow? Um, you've got to, it's very, very important, especially when you're dealing with drive um, and, and any site, if you get the car on the property, can they easily get into the drive lane? Can they get out and make sure there's like not dead end parking, which is when you get in and there's no way to get off the property. So um Visibility we touched on, but um, again, these pieces are extremely important to remember. Um, can you see it from all directions? Um, are, and are there any impairments? Um, we do this actually when we go back and look at existing properties as well, when we're assessing, you know, um, how do we improve sales, perhaps? Um, like we talked about sometimes what these cities require with these crazy, um, landscape restrictions, it gets challenging. So you want to make sure that you're, you've got a good line of sight. Parking is extremely important. You want adjacent and what we call convenient parking. And then again, if you can get it, reciprocal parking if you're part of a shopping center. Signage, very important. Um, we, we have something called a pool sign, a pylon sign, monument sign, um, freestanding or shared sign, and shopping center, typically there's going to be multiple tenants on a shopping center sign. Um, and then we want to identify easements, um, whether they're public, utility, private, access. And then in many cases, if you're in a shopping center, you want to identify your protected area, which is we're building here, we're counting on this lane, these access points and these lanes of cross access um, and parking. So things may change in the future, whether it's another anchor tenant that comes in or another tenant, but you, we typically identify what we call a protected area that the landlord would never come and change without our reasonable approval. And then we'd probably try to get something if we had to change, <laughs> negotiate something else. Um, so that brings us actually to a break. Are we about that time of the break or how are we doing? What's the time? It is 2.13. 2.13. Does anybody want to break or should we just keep going? It's up to you guys. Keep going. Keep going. Well, with that, um, I think most of you probably hopefully know Erwin. Um, he's a 94 LMU grad from the MBA school. Um, he's a board member of uh, our REACT. And he's also part of the team that created uh, this real estate certificate program. He will have a seminar in February, February 10th, I believe, which is? Uh, negotiating leases to minimize risk and maximize NOI. And over and above everything else he does, he also serves on the Dean's Advisory Committee. So welcome. To well, thank you. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. I always enjoy your you're understanding more about uh, your business. And my business is really understanding customers. Our business. Yeah. And, and he's, he's asking me more questions than you guys are asking me. He wants to know what's behind the scenes. Because <laughs> yeah. we're actually trying to, we've done deals before, but we're actually trying to do a deal right now. Um, but it's, you know, it's, we really wanted you guys to see kind of how, how does this come together? How do you go into a trade area? How do you identify a property and come up with this phenomenal shopping center? And this is one of a whole portfolio that Irwin has with his partners. Um, but it's also kind of to break up the monotony, it's a lot more fun. So I'd love to give you the floor. So I think I, I think there's a couple of things to really focus on. And, and we always try to understand 
our customer, our tenants. And when I'm asking Kathy about hurdle rates, we have pro formas as well, right? So when we analyze a property, we're looking at the economics, the rent roll, okay? And in this particular property, um, it's on Topanga and Irwin. We bought it from Catellus. And uh, we got a call from a broker that we had known for years and years and years. And he had a relationship with Catellus. His name is Bill Bauman. He's a great, great broker and a great, great guy. And he said, Catellus is probably going to sell this because it's not their core holdings. They are not retail operators. Um, this was occupied by Toys R Us and Office Depot. Uh, the lease with Toys R Us was signed in 1974. <laughs> I was seven years old. Okay. I love that. Why do you think I love it? Thank you. What's that? Because their time has, they're kind of antiquated. Their lease is expiring. Their lease rate was severely on the market. Okay. And we, we always look for sites that are occupied by C retailers that are A intersections. This particular property is in Woodland Hills. If you look at the tapestry segmentation that Kathy put together, and you know, I, I saw a few things that really made sense um, about this site. People like to live in apartments, okay? They are very technological oriented. They order from amazon.com, okay? We're, we're gonna get into kind of the, the, the rest of this, but, all these factors, there's huge daytime population. It's directly across the street from a major mall, okay, in, in, in the trade area. You've got freeway on and off ramps. You've got signalized access. The access component for any retailer is critical to their operation. The visibility is critical. So let me ask a question. There's a mall across the street, and they don't have surface parking. I've got surface parking, which is cheaper to operate, the mall or this? So the mall has a, a parking garage? Yeah. Okay. Way cheaper to operate this. Okay. Why is that an advantage? So think about occupancy costs, okay? So anytime we talk to Kathy, I'm like, I need this rent. And typically the retailer says, well, I want to pay this rent. Mm -hmm. right? So it's a matter of figuring out a happy medium where we can still transact and it makes economic sense. She can get to her hurdle rate. I can get to my hurdle rate. But being across the street from the mall with surface parking is a huge competitive advantage because the operating cost per square foot on the mall are about $22 a foot, okay, per annum, okay? This, $10 a foot, okay? So I've got $12 in, in better operating costs at this location with surface parking, with better visibility, okay? Which means I should be able to get higher rents in the mall, okay? How is value, uh, how do I look at value? Your finance guy. Mm -hmm. It's it's income stream, right? So if I've got higher base rents, guess what? I'm gonna have more value. Um, you notice the daytime pop, you notice the residential that's going on in, in, in the area. The other thing that uh, and we got lucky in this, we got really lucky. We bought this and the specific plan was still being worked on. After we bought it, uh, there was, let's see, let's, yeah. Yeah, let's give you that. There used to be a, uh, a retailer that occupied this, this part of the parcel. It's 2.3 acres. Who was that? Off Broadway. Oh, yeah. And that was an old gas company building that they converted to a retail location. It used to be Tower Records. Then it used to be Good Guys. Then it used to be Off, off Broadway. And we entered into a termination agreement with Off-Broadway 
and we had the right to terminate them. We then put that on the market uh, for a uh, for residential use, uh, users, and that was bought, and that's out of the ground with three hundred apartment units, very high end. Built in customers. Users. Yes, built in customers. What else do you see here? What's that? Signal. On both ends. On both ends. Signal there. Signal there. 47,000 cars per day. You look at some of that site criteria, 25 is a good number. This is almost a double. Right? This signal, when we were um, working on this, Westfield was working on their entitlement streets. It was part of their mitigations. Okay, their traffic mitigations, they were obligated to put that signal in. Great for us. Which is the cost of a traffic signal, 100, 150, way more? Way more. We, we, we try to put a traffic signal in Northridge, and with the off sites, all, all the stuff, we were close to 900,000. Come on. Oh, yeah. Wow. Oh, yeah. With the traffic studies and the traffic studies, engineering. Wow. It's just, it, it was. Now, so they took the burden. They took the burden. We got the benefit because by adding this signal, this allows left out, left in, it, it, it improves the access. So, long story short, you can see this picture was taken when Toys R Us was there. Well, Toys R Us went bankrupt. Okay. A lot of people would be like, oh my God, it's the worst day in the world. I was so happy. Okay. I was so happy because Boys R Us was going away. That 1974 lease was going away. And we have uh, a relationship with a, a broker friend of mine that I, I, I've done a lot of business with. And he says, I've got a grocery store that wants to be there. And uh, let's negotiate a letter of intent. We negotiate a letter of intent. Um, we have to sign a confidentiality, okay? Uh, we have to procure a conditional use permit. Anybody know what a conditional use permit is? Okay, what, do you, what do grocery stores sell? Food? Foods? Okay. The, the, and to get the ability to sell alcohol, they have to get a conditional use permit. We also had to do significant uh, changes to the structure. And... New structural drawings, new HVAC, uh, new glass line, new parking, uh, EV stalls. I mean, just just all these different things. We had to go to the neighborhood council, got their blessing without disclosing who the tenant was. That had been done. Yeah, it, it was. It, just trust us on that. Yeah, just trust us. It's gonna be a it's gonna right. be a grocery store. I just can't tell you who it is. And uh, uh, long story short, um, Amazon. Grocery was our tenant. And so they don't have too many groceries at this point, do they? No, they have this is the first one in the entire world. Okay. We did it, my small little company. Okay. <laughs> and why why is it? It's because of relationships and it's because of delivering. And it's 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 also one controlling bright real estate. Okay. We got so lucky controlling this real estate. So, looking at this, and this is this is another thing that I just just want to point out. I talked about parking. You can't even see any parking here, right? Across the street, you can't see it. They're parking, but it's, it's structured. What's the coverage here? They put three hundred units here on two acres of land. Okay, two, two, two. I got another six acres. What's the highest and best use of this? Probably residential. Okay. But this part of the site is encumbered with leases. So, whereas on that piece, we had the ability to terminate the lease and, and sell that piece off. So, it, it was a separate parcel. So, retail and everybody, everybody. It was like, oh, I want to be in parks. I want to be in the industrial. I want to be uh, doing, I don't know, self-storage. I love retail. Why? 
Why do you think I don't like it? Because I can buy a shopping center with surface parking and get a return on that all the while that land is going way out of the dock. So who announced here? Anybody recollect who announced here? Who follows football? LA Rams. You got Cronky, Cronky bought a piece right down here. So that is another huge positive for this part of the train. If you look around, um, what do they intend to build there? So that's a training facility for the training facility for the for the LA Rams. Right. Yeah. So that's people coming to watch and yeah, people coming to watch. I mean, there's going to be and more than likely he's going to program some retail there. He's mm -hmm. going to, you know, he's, he's going to do some retail. So this is, it's, it's just a, it's just a great site. Um, no drive-throughs are allowed on, on the Bay Canyon. So if you look at Kathy's, Kathy's maps, and you look at the competitor set, most of her competitor set have drive-throughs. Here, you don't have the ability to do that, right? Just because the zoning does not allow drive-throughs. Um, Office Depot, uh, there's 25,000 square feet. Um, at some point, we're probably going to get that space back. Okay. I view that as positive. Um, Citibank, how big are banks here? That's a 6,000 square foot bank. How many times do you go to the bank? Anyway, I get positive checks. I, I, I can do most of my transactions. Just on this phone. So banks are shrinking. Yep. That's another opportunity. Uh, Amazon's doing really, really well here. Uh, there may be an expansion opportunity for them. Um, we've got leases rolling. So any, anytime we look at a property, I always look at the rent roll. What are the rents compared to market? And are they under market? I don't want to buy at market or above market rents. I want to buy under market rents. That makes sense. So that gives you an idea of the 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 layout. So if I could do a drive through on this traffic corridor, I'd want to be right on that hard corner. Um, that that pad has the visibility, right? There's a traffic signal. Again, huge traffic counts. But controlled access on and off the property, ton of parking, and great retail center, great anchors. So ideal, ideal path. And what's great about grocery stores? Why do you think I like grocery stores? People need to be more than consistent. consistent. Daily needs. Daily needs. So the amount of trips to a grocery store compared to a mall, probably one trip per week to the mall, maybe. There's probably close to three trips here. Okay. So what does that do? If you have more trips, that benefits your side tenants because they actually get sales because there's more trips. Somebody's going to go to market and say, you know what? I need to get some paper from Office Depot. I'm going to get my nails done. I'm going to buy some seas candy, etc. Um, so the model is is, is Quite simple. And when COVID hit, I can tell you I'm super scared. But the one thing that we found out was grocery is here to stay. Necessity and the, the, the amount of volumes that the grocers um, experienced went way up. Um, So here's demos. So in this, I just want to mention that, so he's talking about the shopping center and what, what we're working from is what we call a setup or a marketing package. So if, if I thought, if I want to be in that trade area and my broker's out there helping me try to find a site, it's like, oh, you know, Paragon's got this great new shopping center. Here's the deal. And so from page one all the way through, it's, it's kind of consistent to kind of what we were looking for. It starts with the big picture, kind of gives a narrative. Um, 
it, it's starting with yeah so here we go like big oh sorry like, yeah so of course the beautiful rendering um and then you know what are the highlights prominent location boom 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 i mean this is everything that you can kind of encapsulate real quickly as far as the highlights um and then site pitch features you obviously had to say new <laughs> because of what you were doing um, the most parking friendly environment, which is, that, is if I'm going to go to a shopping center, I'm going to go 100 times to service parking before right. I'm going to go to structure. And then leading, so, and then this identifies um, above, so Paragon's Irwin and the developer, and then Newmark is the brokers that are um, working the project for, for Paragon. And then bring it to what do you got? So this is just such a nicely done package and exactly what a tenant wants to see when, when they are assessing. Because I can use this. I If I like the site and I get, I go to make a deal, I've got to kind of sell it to my company as well. The people that are operating the restaurant have to buy in and give a sales estimate that makes sense. So this is part of what I use internally. So if we go, it's a very logical. Um, and then this is what we call a, essentially a trade area area. Um, this and this this makes it look even better i mean right this is what you're trying to explain as far as i don't know if you guys have ever been to this shopping center across the street but it's probably the nicest shopping center in the entire san gabriel in san fernando valley um but also extremely well identified with what exactly Irwin just explained so you don't have too many questions as far as the streets the traffic counts and who's around you so he starts with the big the big picture and then narrows it down to next slide and just a little more focus, just closer in to the intersection, which we talked about. Um, and then again, um, that that that's such a huge bonus what we have there with that residential. So a rendering of what you is it is that built yet? It's or, built. It's open. Wow. Oh, did you have the ram? Did you have the Rams thing over there? Uh, I do not, uh, but it talks about Westfield and what they did there. Again, they're adding 1,400 luxury apartment units, hotels, and you know, prominent office space. Again, this is our site. So that's a basic, what we call a site plan. And get, this gives you aerials from other, other um, vantage points. It shows you grocers in the area, who are you competing against? And why is there a need, um, and where where the site is? There's something called retail gravity. There's so much retail gravity at this intersection because you're at a regional mall, right? So regional mall draws from what? That that slide that we went through from ICSC. It's about 25 miles, okay. And then add on the daytime pop. So think about daytime pop. A lot of people working. Where do they go? I go to the grocery store to get prepared foods. Who's been to the Whole Foods in uh, Manhattan Beach? It's like a big restaurant, right? You can get you can get all sorts of things there for lunch and, and really good things. Mm -hmm. So that's and think about the profitability on those on those items. It's huge. Those margins are big because people will, will pay to uh, be there. Again, population density, demographics, education levels. That was another thing mm -hmm. that Kathy had on her slide. Very well educated population. Okay. And the fact that you're you see the star, which is the site, but the proximity to the freeways is just has is why you have such a large draw here. The 101 has 258,000 cars a day. Yeah, it's 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 amazing, and, and the, so and freeways. So when you look at a site, and, and Kathy will tell you this too, there's trade barriers. Okay, there's trade barriers to the site. A freeway sometimes is a trade barrier. So so people on this side will shop this side, and people on the other side will shop on the other side. So you you always got to look at that as. So this one is probably the most telling and honestly the most impressive aerial of the whole package because this shows rock down site three you know 
3,500, no, 350 units, 134 units, 300 units, QS, 347 units, 1,500 units, 225 units, 275 units. And summarized at the top right corner, yeah. projected that those are additional units coming into the market, which is, you don't usually see that kind of gross growth in a, a dense trade area, but it's, you know, it's everybody's going vertical. So this is, and, and if you look at the specific plan, and that that's, in other words, the zoning regulations for this trade area, they want to make this the second downtown. Second downtown, LA. they want office, they want daytime pop, they want amenities, they want hotels for the valley. So this is probably one of our the best sites we have in our portfolio. Yeah, it's really well done. A residential area as well. So if if, if you're if you're um, you know the grocer and you're looking at this and you're saying, wait a second, all these units are coming on board. What is the future growth in terms of sales volume? Right. So sales volume growth in terms of Kathy's IRR model over a 20 year period, mm -hmm. if they've got great sales volume growth because they have better population density, what is that going to mean? That's going to make mean more sales. What's that going to mean for me? More rent. Okay. More mm, rent. Not necessarily. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> more rent, uh, more value. But yeah. You know, that's, that's. Nope. No, you can go back. You don't have to be done. Oh, but okay. Um, so, anyways, we, we, you know, the reality is timing is everything in this business. It really is. And relationships. And relationships. I mean, you're a broker, have the word, and you were able to act on it. He brought it to you. You're able to act on it. Yeah. And it was, a, it, was a, it was a very tough negotiation. I mean, Skitalis was like, we're not giving you a due diligence period. You got you to gotta go. All right. We had to find a capital partner that was willing to buy an asset with Toys R Us. You think Toys R Us had big credit at the time we bought this? No. We, we had to find a lender willing to lend. Okay. And you know, luckily, we, we, we have a high net worth um, uh, partner, that equity investor that loved the real estate, saw the vision. And so my background is I came from a publicly traded REIT that specialized in grocery anchor shopping centers. So I focused on grocery anchor shopping centers. I knew, I knew if we ever got that voice back, it was going to be a grocery buy. And that was going to be a huge benefit. The other benefit is, okay, because of the amount of trips that come to this site, what is the value, okay, of grocery and shopping centers? There's a lot of demand for grocery and shopping centers because of the fact they're necessity. The economy is bad or good. People are still going to the grocery store. Period. End of story. Um, and then they're expanding. I mean, it's it's a little it's interesting, and you see it, but they're expanding on their prepared meals, right? To okay. go, so it's kind of how you pivot with challenge challenging times. I mean, they know that there's big money in the Paneras and the grab and goes, and so most and you you know Whole Foods is a great example. Um, it's not just going and getting groceries. It's you can go and get the whole meal. And and so to go. Think about the demographics and the, 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 the tapestry, as, as Kathy mentioned. Technology is such an important component of a lot of the residents here. So why do you think Amazon picked this site? Exactly that. Because they've got walkout technology where you don't even have to go to the cashier. You can walk out on your phone. Have you guys, anybody been to an Amazon grocery? Or have you heard about an Amazon grocery or Amazon stores? Yeah. Pretty amazing. So they got cards. You can you can put stuff in the cards. We'll take pictures of it, weigh it, and and you don't even have to go through the cashier. You just go out. All right. So technology is evolving so quickly in real estate, and it's such a opportunity. And Kathy and I have been doing this so long. I mean, 
before, we didn't have the tools that all of you have to analyze a site. And the amount of data you can get, uh, there's this, this uh, company called Placer AI. I would encourage all of you to take a look at it. It's amazing. You can, you can pick this site, you can figure out, okay, what they do in sales last year, where did the population come from, how are they doing as a chain average, what's the competitive set, who's their major competitor, um, and you can see trends, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Are they growing in sales? Are they decreasing in sales? So the technology is huge, huge um, growth market for real estate, and it's going to continue. It's only getting better. Um, I'm wondering if you can even tell me this, but how long has been this for the engineering? 15 years. It's a good question. So, um, and so we're, we're, we're building two locations right now for Starbucks in Northern California. Starbucks is great. Are they and, easy to do leases with? No. <laughs> I like working with Kathy there. <laughs> so it's, it's, so 10 year leases, okay. We just had this little bump in the road with rising interest rates. Okay. So by, by the time that those are ready to sell, okay, there's probably eight years left to turn. Is that tough? Tougher. Yes. <laughs> it's very it's 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 more difficult to finance an eight year lease. Than a 15 year lease or a 20 year lease. Okay. 20 year leases are great. I like, like anchor tenants, you want long lease terms. Mom and pops, you want short lease terms with no options. Okay. So, um, and so us as a tenant, we, we do a 20 year deal. But one thing, if you get down into the lease or the lease, is that we try to protect the sale. Or if they, we like an option to buy it if they do sell it. But if they sell it, assume what happens, the value goes up. So what happens there? Our property taxes go up. So there's a whole part of our negotiations and our leases that we try to, we arm wrestle yeah. and rarely get some protection about when, how soon they can sell and how many, you know, how many sales out that maybe we would be protected. But it impacts our bottom line when they sell. But we're a great tenant. Developers want to do deals with us because our credit's so great and they can sell it for a great value. So it's just a absolutely I mean it's 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 all about credit, right? It's all about what is the credit of the tenant. Okay. That's that's important. Um and because at the end of the day, you want to you want to have something of value that you can monetize if you need to monetize. The the, the real game in real estate is not monetizing. It's holding. Real estate's a long-term game. Having said that, though, we we do monetize assets because what we, we we try to do is take smaller assets and trade them into bigger assets. Okay. Like we did an in and out in San Jose and sold that and we traded it into um, like a like a larger shopping center. So that's what what you want to do increase your, your your square footage but this thing's this thing's gold i mean it's 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 it's, it's just a it's a great piece of risk any other questions thank you so much sure. i thought it's a perfect demonstration of you know from start to finish and how it got done and it's a home run property all right no questions on that end um, I'm going to jump into a slide I added. Uh, and again, I just thought this would be great for everybody attending as students to be able to see um, a few students that have graduated from LMU and have, um, I can say they are all extremely successful in terms of where they are in the industry, especially at a relatively young age. So the first handsome gentleman up there is um, a gentleman by the name of Parker Middleton. He was a finance major and graduated in 2014. He's currently the director of Kava. Do you guys know what Kava is? 
it's it's a great restaurant. Oh, okay. So is she, um, is she John Middleton's son? He is. Oh, John's a great guy. He's a great guy. So his father was in the business as well. Has done a ton of uh, restaurant rep. Right. Hey, islands with the well. Islands, islands, yeah. And was he PF Chang's too, or yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah? So his father was in the business, so he'd been around it as well. Um, I actually don't even know Parker. I know of him because of his father and um, one of our very, very dear friends is really good friends with him. So I reached out to him via LinkedIn. I said, "Hey, we're doing a seminar, and you know, we're telling stories of you know, how long we've been doing this. It's like I really think that students would enjoy seeing." Um, hearing some of these stories, and um, each one of these um, individuals is ready, willing, and able to talk to any one of you, reach out for any advice, or hear more of their story. So Parker said that he worked in restaurants through college, and he knew he wanted to stay close to the restaurant industry. So during he interned at several restaurant groups through college. So he interned at Medicino Farms, Lazy Dog, which is the Sims, yeah, and Sims Restaurants. So he started his career on the leasing team of a developer called Mace Rich. Mace Rich is a huge um, shopping center developer and they actually own uh, Santa Monica Place. Um, so he was in charge of finding restaurants to come into Santa Monica Place. Um, but he joined Cava and he joined the tenant side, what we call the, or the tenant side of retail um, as a real estate manager in 2016. So he was covering one and then three markets, and he's grown to overseeing the entire real estate team nationally. And he's grown the brand from 16 locations to uh, um, over 250. I mean, that's from 2016. Um, so uh, he's somebody I would encourage you to reach out to if you just say, "How do I do? How, where do I start?" And you know what? You're not always going to start in the most glamorous of positions. And these other stories kind of tell you that as well. I mean, you got to be willing to, you know, jump in and roll your sleeves up and, and learn. Um, so Natalie Pebbles, um, she graduated in 2011. She had a, I think she was psychology in uh, the College of Liberal Arts. So she's, it's funny because from Parker, I got a bullet point, boom, boom, boom. From both, both the girls is more of a narrative. Um, so I'm going to read what she wrote because you're going to like her story. So it starts with the story is a bit long, but I think it's reliable. So I want to share the detail. She graduated in 2011 with a major in psychology. In college, she worked three jobs. She worked total town, total tan down the street from campus. She worked as a freelance makeup artist and she did some apartment leasing. She thought she was going to pursue a job in Hollywood as a makeup artist. And she didn't enjoy the multifamily leasing as much as um, the makeup artistry, but she needed some internship credits to graduate. She couldn't afford to take a free internship during regular business hours. So she, her dad's in the business, he's a developer. There's a theme a little bit, but um, her, but you've got people now that you know that you've talked to. She's, so her dad um, let her intern for him nights and weekends. She got her real estate license and while working for him, and she took an interest to studying demographics and analytics um, and property evaluations. Um, nearing graduation, she decided she wanted to pursue a retail real estate career. Instead of going through her dad's contacts, she went on to Craigslist, where she found a job with a posting for a broker with present value properties, Greg Fisher. So she was hired before she graduated. Um, and she um, she actually finished her final, final exam at 9 p.m. at her cubicle in her new broker office. She spent about two years working as a broker on a draw. So all she made was $2,000 a month. And she was living at her parents' house because you can't survive off of that. And then there's a smiley face with a tongue sticking out. <laughs> um, so she got, she got involved volunteering at ICSC NextGen. Um, as she really enjoyed networking. You can tell she's kind of a social butterfly. So it was through ICX, ICSE NextGen, that's what I talked to you guys about, um, you know, the group that is focused on younger members. Um, she got a job with Jersey Mike's. They reached out, Jersey Mike's reached out to ICSC and they said, hey, we're looking for somebody to bring in-house to Jersey Mike's. Um, her name was mentioned several times because she was showing up to these events. Um, that, so she said, the power of networking. 
get out there and make your name known. So she didn't want to, she originally she didn't want to move in-house as a tenant rep because she thought she's going to make a lot more money brokering. And potentially you you can make a lot, but you know, brokering is commission only, right? And then once you make a commission, um, the house gets part of the commission. If you're so the brokers on Erwin's project, his listing brokers would work with the tenant broker. And so they'd split the big commission. And then each of those brokers would split it with the house. So if, you knew, if you're doing enough deals, it's great. And the upside potential is phenomenal as a broker. There's no question. But so she was hesitant to go in-house. She thought she'd soon be making a lot of money in brokerage. And she thought, she thought in-house would limit her. Her dad told her um, to follow the culture, not the cash. So she fell in love with Jersey Mike's culture and she took the job. She said, my career skyrocketed. I became a real estate manager at the age of 24 and a director at the age of 27. She's incredibly passionate and fulfilled with what she's doing. So she currently sits on the LMU BCLA, the Bellarmine, Bellarmine College of Liberal Arts Advisory Board. And she's a California state chair for the next gen ICSC. So she's involved um, with both of those so she can help others, everybody here, transition from college to career. So she's always open for calls and emails. And she said, best advice for early 20s, network, get as many events as you can, get involved. And then she said, when you get involved, when you go to these events, be the first one in and the last one out. And then again, she requoted what her dad said, said, culture over cash. So, um, and it, I, I know her pretty well. I actually um, worked with her when she went to go interview. I was one of her references and I kind of gave her a little advice on, you know, how to dress and how to like, you know, kind of how to just be uh, styled and have Kind of what to expect through the interview process. Um, because I mean, so Kristen actually they were brokers about the same time. So I'll tell you about Kristen Anderson. Um, so I and I love you know seeing where these girls have gone. So Kristen Anderson is my daughter. Um, she um, graduated in 2012. She was also liberal arts. Um and it's and and these two in the liberal arts, and I was liberal arts as well. So here we are in the business college, but um, there's, you know, it's not just restricted. Um, there's a lot of people that are not in the business college that have huge successful careers in real estate. Um, so she had no idea <laughs> what career path she wanted to take. Luckily, she had fantastic role models to help her guide her path. So obviously through me um, and then her grandfather and then also her stepdad, Mark, who I told you about, had been at all those restaurants. So she graduated and that weekend, we're like, we're going to ICSC. Do you want to come? So ICSC in May is a big international convention. So it's um, it's the Las Vegas Convention Center. And what last year after COVID, it was about twenty five thousand people. But that convention has it has tenants, it has brokers, it has developers, it has landlords, people peddling sites. It's huge. Um, and again, they have a student program if you're interested. So she said she, um, we suggested she attend. We introduced her to a bunch of people. Um, ultimately, she got a job as an intern um, with Red Mountain Development Group. So they're a developer out of Orange County. And this was not a glamorous job. This was, you know, we just downsized our office. So we'd love it if you clean out the plan room and make these phone calls and, you know, condense these files. So she was there about nine months, and then she made the transition to brokerage with a company called Maine and Maine, who um, they're kind of a boutique uh, brokerage company. Um, they represent a lot of great restaurant companies, and they do some landlord work as well. Um, so she, because she was just learning the business at the time, she took a role as an operations coordinator. So again, she's answering the phones and putting together books. And then she um, got a real estate license so she could become an agent. And then was you know working with her partners and getting deals done, and she became a partner. Um, and then um, she decided she actually got married last October, and then came back and thought, you know what, she she decided to give in house tenant rep a try. So she's recently started with um, she's a real estate uh, 
manager, real estate and development manager for King's Seafood Company. Have you guys ever been to King's Seafood? Moo on Ocean or Moo, Meat on Ocean, Water Grill. So they have, um, it's a family, a private family run, but they have multiple. 25 plus, and many of them are like $25 million volumes. They're big restaurants. Um, great group. Um, so she's uh, very different from brokerage, but it's been a great experience so far. So her advice is, you know, the most important thing I've learned over the years in this business is that your relationships mean everything. So make sure to get involved, network as much as possible, and always follow up with the people that you need. So the common theme in networking and, um, and following up. So again, feel free to reach out to any one of those um, individuals. They're happy to help. Um, if you have any questions or, or have interest in going that route. Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit about, um, we've got about uh, an hour. Um, jump into a little bit on what's happening and changing in the market. And it's hard to predict, um, but as far as, I mean, it's something that we've always got to keep an eye on, be aware of, uh, monitoring, you know, competitor trends, economic trends, um, shifts. It's a matter of driving the markets, driving the trade areas, being out there, um, making sure you know what's going on. Have your finger on the pulse, essentially. Um, you've got to strategically position for what's next. Um, so, I mean, due to COVID, we've seen a lot of changes in the recent years. Um, currently, we're seeing huge supply chain issues. And everybody's seeing it, right? I mean, you're hearing about it. I don't know if any of you have all driven the port. Um, if you go by and you see all the, the containers stacked, they're still not able to offload all that. Um, so that's causing delays in many things. It's causing prices to go up. Um, we, there's huge um, construction um, delays and cost concerns. Um, we've, we've had a lot of our pipeline shift We've had franchisees that have decided to actually hold off developing at all until they get we get our arms around you know getting construction costs down because it's it's alarming right now it really is um, rising material and land costs um, so uh, like other things to keep an eye on is you know if if your trade areas are shifting um, and um, you you know you've got to it it happens occasionally and you're you've got to be aware. If, Again, being in the market, um, we see tenants going away, um, like our, you know, Toys R Us or, um, for instance, Sears. Uh, does anybody remember Sears? <laughs> Not anymore. Because <laughs> um, they closed almost all their uh, stores um, because of declining sales. Um, and they were only down to 182 stores, down from 3,500. 3, That's insane just 10 years ago. Um, so, but the one thing we, we do say is that failures for some are opportunities for others. And perfect example of what we just went through, you know, toys is antiquated, people aren't shopping there anymore. There's many other online options and uh, more, more vibrant options. So, um, so, you know, converting properties into something that the internet can't provide. So there's always, the, you get your real estate experts and you get different retailers and you kind of figure out solutions to those goals. goals. Um, and like, I think Erwin actually kind of even mentioned this. Most know that bricks and mortar, we call bricks and mortar, you know, the, the buildings and, you know, because you build it with bricks and mortar, the building, it's not, it's never going away for the majority of key tenants, right? But we still have to have a presence. Grocery stores still have to be out there, and they they've got to be operating. Um, so just some of the some of the things we've seen with some of the dark spaces as they're being retenanted, and they're taking some of those big old uh, Sears buildings, which used to be a major anchor tenant for malls, um, and they're kind of subdividing them. There's food halls and different uh, multi-tenant retail 
um, entertainment, um, gyms, and actually, probably most importantly, a lot of transition to residential. Um, because as we know, there's a huge need for that. So, you know, behind your business, you've got to be re ready to pivot. You've got to be able to act upon with, you know, things that you can anticipate coming, you know, are we, are we, um, we, we know there's inflation. Are we going to see a recession? Most say yes, some say maybe, some say we're in it, some. So who has the crystal ball? Um, I don't know anybody, but all you can do is keep yourself open-minded and educated. Um, the more you know, the better. So you can be prepared to act. Um, so I think we talked a little bit about really what happened as um, through and after COVID and the, because the last seminar I gave was in February, but um, the, you know, the, the it, so many things changed because nobody was going out. So all of a sudden it was like, you needed more curbside to pick up. Um, we, that QSR restaurants, we were deemed essential, thankfully, or else we would have really um, been in big trouble. Um, yes. So we closed our dining rooms and, be, and it was drive through only. And actually, that actually brought labor down because there was nobody having to maintain and clean the dining rooms. Um, and and then we were so busy because people didn't have other places to go. They couldn't go to their sit-down restaurants. So our sales, we were we were scared when COVID hit. And we started talking to landlords about, oh, potentially we may need to, um, we're not gonna, we're, we're the good guys. We're not gonna not pay our rent. There were tenants out there that just said, we're not paying because we don't know what's gonna happen. There's big restaurant companies that we know of that did this. But we said, you know, we're talking to you, landlord, and we're saying, we don't know what's going to happen. We will pay our rent, but let us defer our rent for a year, and we will start paying then. Um, we got we were successful in many cases, so that kind of offset the initial scare. Um, but it, it was just about adjusting. And um, so uh, let's see. Brands, yeah. Oh, and then you, you saw a lot of restaurants that all of a sudden it's like, well, people can't come in, so we're gonna like package up and and package up meals and grab and go. And by the way, you can buy alcohol, bottles of wine. Um, and then all of a sudden, cities who are always the most difficult to work with to get any permitting done, but all of a sudden they're allowing patios. You know, you you've all seen them out, outside dining. Um, so big changes and just overall as a good business, you've just got to be, you've got to be creative and be ready to pivot when, when change comes. Um, you, patterns change. Um, so I thought, I think that's kind of just touching on. Can I ask a question? Are you doing uh, drive through only stores? So we've done them in the past. Yeah. And we've opened a few and we've closed them. Okay. So think about in and out who started as drive through yep. and they've um, evolved to big dining rooms. Um, I'm not sure, I think they were actually looking at drive through only, but I just think that trend is is short-lived. Yep. I think ultimately people are gonna wanna be back in the country. We do have a drive through only prototype. We are opening a few, but we most likely won't. Um, I don't think that we'll be too many. Yep. And when I, um, when I look at a drive through only, I'm saying you've gotta make sure that there's room to bump out so when people do want to come back, we want to be able to make sure that we've got a dining room. Because I don't think that's ever going away. So um, this is just kind of an example of pivoting and changing. Um, because you look, for the most part, all of us, this is the top, this is showing the top 15. Um, for the most part, we're all still growing. But look at the few declines that are there. So McDonald's, um, they've actually gone down 164 units. Um, and Subway is another big one. Subway is down 1,100, 1,162. Um, and that's just a sign, sign of the times. They've probably built too quickly, um, built too many, traders have shifted. Um, so that's just kind of, um, you know, showing how many, you know, McDonald's, this is kind of the pecking order. And thankfully we're above, above Burger King at this point, it makes me happy. Um, so as far as number of units, um, 
I have written down a few. Oh, yeah. Okay, so just to give you an idea of QSRs. So McDonald's was founded in 55. They have 38,000 locations. And this is um, actually, there's a report. It's, it's listed in um, the references, but there's a quick service restaurant, QSR um, magazine that prints these statistics. Um, and I pulled that, this information from there. So they, they were opened um, their first restaurant in 55, 1955. They have 38,000 locations in 100 countries. They do 46 billion in sales. But if you think about 55, 1955 sounds like a long time ago, right? But that's 567 restaurants a year. So talk about needing a real estate team to, um, <laughs> to get out there and find sites. Starbucks was founded in 71. Currently, we're showing that they have, so this is from 2020, this is year in 2020. So I couldn't find the same slide with the same information. Um, they didn't print it that way. So I pulled this information um, to show you the difference. So they were founded in 71. Currently they have 33,833 locations in 84 countries. So over 51 years, they, that's 663 restaurants a year, units a year, I'd say. Um, and their mobile pay, that's another pivot for retailers and in, re in the restaurant in particular, is digital or digital platform because um, in the last several years, that's just huge. So if it's gone up 400% in five years and um, it's 70% of the US chain's volume. So yeah, that's staggering in my opinion. Um, but then you talk about Chick-fil-A who, um, yeah, so they, 1980. So they're down there, right? So they, have, they only have 2,800 restaurants and they're only in the US. They're in the US, DC and Puerto Rico. So, but they were founded in 46. So they started really in malls and food courts and then started doing freestanding. Um, but the scary thing about Chick-fil-A is their volume. They do, they, they average 8.1 million and they're only open six days a week, which is insane. So our LA volume is like 2.1 and we're open seven days. Um, and McDonald's, what do we say their average? I think in the LA GMA, they're probably about 3.6, 3.7. I have that on, I'll show you this sheet that we track. Um, so I don't, I don't need to go into all that, but talk about what's found in 62. They have 7,000 locations in 30 countries. Their digital is up to 20%. Um, and that's about 116 restaurants a year. And so, yeah. Can I explain? So the, the, the digital platform, because you're seeing this anytime you're on the Starbucks, I mean, that's just, yeah. and it seems your profit margins are way more just because there's, there's, it's just more efficient and quicker. Right. What is that adding to volume? Is that a 20% increase in volume? Is it a 10% increase? You know, that's a great question. And I don't have I don't have an answer. Um, I could try to find out a, a, a range, um, but definitely yes. I, yes. And it cuts down on labor. So labor is a huge issue right now. Not only, I mean, not only getting people to work, but also what you have to pay now. It's it's crazy, so um, crazy high. So between digital ordering and then also people put in, we put in kiosks for, you know, you're walking up and it's less contact with our workers, but it saves, again, saves on labor. So you got to cut down those margins. Um, can, I, can I ask another question? I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. but, um, you want to keep your rent to sales ratio below what percentage? They say below 10. Below 10. Mm -hmm. And then what is labor as a percentage of your total cost? Mm -hmm. So, so that's how it, it just varies depending on market. It does. Okay. It does. Yeah. And living in the crazy state of California, there's a bill they're trying to pass right now for fast food restaurants. A, B, I can't remember exactly what it is, but they're trying to get the governing entity to determine what we pay our employees. Just fast food not any other restaurant segment or casual dining or so everybody's up in a rage about that. <laughs> um, so that's just a little bit of information on um, 
giving you um, a background on you know who's growing, how big they are, and again, um, I just wanted to give you a perspective of how many restaurants they've built over the years, kind of tying back into the need for people on the ground being the real estate experts for these groups. Um, but this also shows new opportunities because if, if Burger King is closing stores, you can convert that to way of uh, use for We've done several Burger Kings. So a lot of Burger King franchisees are coming to the end of their franchise agreement. To renew their franchise agreement, they've got to do a significant remodel. Um, and a lot of them are saying, we're just not passionate about the brand anymore. We're not going to invest that money. So they get burgers to take it to market. And we love converting burgers. And how long is franchise agreement typically? Typically, years? it's typically 20 or 30. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I'm going to, I want to first dive into, I just wanted to give you an example of um, when another tool that I did not um, put in the deck, but I want to just at least show you. Um, this is, we have this deck that I can put, well, this is, it's not up there, it's here, because this is more information than I'm able to give out. But the way I look at a market, so I'm in the LA GMA. So the LA GMA is Los Angeles, Orange County, San Bernardino, Riverside, and Ventura. So um, we have this information for every single GMA desi designated marketing area in the country. So um, in Los Angeles, um, we know that there's 18 and a half million people. We have 135 windows. So we've got some catching up to do because, so this will show you, like if I could share with, I can tell you this, but I can't have you take a picture. But for example, my competitors, McDonald's to R135, they have 529 and, and that's freestanding. They have another 31 non-traditional. And so here's another thing we look at. We look at, okay, so there's 18 and a half million people we have 135 restaurants. So our population penetration is we have one Wendy's for every 136,000 people. So McDonald's has a McDonald's for every 35,000. Um, Jack is huge in, in LA. They're huge in San Diego too, obviously, but they're not so much once you get out of California. Um, and um, they have 474 restaurants which is just about 39,000 people per jet. We gauge ourselves, we think we can get to somewhere where Carl's Jr. is, as far as the number of restaurants, they have 349, and um, that's 53,000 people per Carl's Jr. So we're looking, um, if there's any developers out there, brokers out there, <laughs> we're looking for sites, um, as many of these um, competitors are as well. But it's amazing, and I'm actually surprised to see like El Pollo Loco has 277 in the LIG. Um, so they're off to a pretty good start. And then you look at McDonald's. Um, the main reason I can't share this, some of it is public knowledge, but um, McDonald's tracks at 3.8 as a DMA average, and that's against a national average of 3.2. So they do better here in LA. I and mean, we have that information for all these. So it's tough to compete again against like uh, the chicks. Let's see where we have chick play at almost eight, 7.7 7 million, six days a week. And then Raising Canes, has anybody been to a Raising Canes? They're on fire and they're paying a lot of money and they average 6.6 million. So they can pay a lot more rent, but we're a nicer tenant. So that's why you would always want to go with us. Right? Um, so I thought it would be a good idea just to, I mean, I don't know if there's any questions out there. I, you haven't mentioned it, you know. Okay, so I thought, you know, everything that we've talked about, you know, going from the macro, looking at the market, pulling up, you know, how do we even get to where we identify a piece of land? Um, and it's, you know, really challenges that we have are affordability and availability. I mean, it's, especially in LA, it's so dense. Um, it's, you know, we're looking for A locations. 
Um, one of the books that I have um, that I was going to recommend, let's see, that one. I have this book on the um, at the end as far as references, and it's something you can get online. Um, it's one of the most simple but easy books to read, the ABCs of site selection. Um, and I actually talked to this author on Monday. I, I, I emailed him before I used him as a reference. The book is a reference in the first uh, seminar, but I, I had a discussion with him. And uh, he was he was telling me, you know, well, you know, the gold standard, you know, is, you know, on an A location and you would never, uh, he told me that he got this advice from a McDonald's real estate person. He was trying to get McDonald's to look at some of these properties. And um, he goes, this guy named Greg Alexander. I'm like, well, I don't know Greg. Greg works at Wendy's now. <laughs> so we always laugh about the degrees of separation in this business. It's a little scary. But basically, he's saying, you know, you would talk about looking for allocations, but don't ever bring me a deal that you wouldn't invest your own money into. Um, so it's just, and that's, I actually do that with that. I don't even think about that. That's something that is like, okay, I'd do this. I would personally run this restaurant and operate this restaurant. Um, if, if I would never present a site that would come to, um, to my company that I wouldn't do personally myself. Um, and then I think, you may have a copy of the sample letter of intent. And rather than including it in this deck, um, I just kind of gave highlights um, because again, getting to your hopefully A plus location, um, you're, you've got to tie down the property. Um, you can't just do it on a handshake or on you know, the back of a cocktail napkin, which I think they used to do back in the sixties, but, um, so you'll, you'll, you have access to this. Um, it's kind of a combination of a few different tenants, letters of intent. It's maybe a bit of a stretch for this seminar, but I thought it'd be good for you to see how it's all pulled together. And really it's just a matter of identifying the property. Um, it, it looks just like a letter. You know, you've got your date, you've got who it's going to, you've got the location, you're identifying what are your premises? You know, are you in a build? You know, you identify you the building, are you the land, how much land, um, and you go on to. Um, and I think I mentioned before, this is not a legal document per se. Um, it's an it's an agreement of the terms, and it'll always say non-binding. So you're not you're only stuck when you sign that lease. Um, and so you're just going through and you're identifying your premises pretty specifically. You're identifying your landlord, you're identifying your tenant, and for the landlords, that's very important. Who's the tenant? Is it um, a shell corporation or let me see financials, right? Um, and then you're uh, you're identifying whose lease are you going to use? Um, what's your lease term? What are your option periods? Um, when are you know you kind of go, it's different for every tenant, but I think this encompasses the big pieces. I mean, would that be some pretty much everything you need to see from, you know, rent, your term, your options. Um, and I added avoid pre-opening rent because you only have a certain amount of time um, to go through uh, and get your permits. Um, what is the permitted use? Do you have exclusives? And exclusives are extremely important because I'm a burger operator. I don't want to be in the same shopping center as another burger operator. Um, I don't, I want to protect that long-term. So I'm going to say, you're not going to bring another tenant that has X percent of burgers. Um, you cannot bring it. And unfortunately, I'm, I was trying to do a deal with Irwin, a great property off of the freeway off ramp in San Bernardino. And he has a Chick-fil-A with a site plan that I actually sent to my entire development team and design team, because I've never seen a drive-through stack like I've seen on that site plan. A lot of you have seen the two lanes. We call them a Y lane. It's a three lane um, drive through with 70 back lane. 76 car I, I missed 76 car stuff. Usually we record like six or 10 or, you know, <laughs> um, there are plenty of doing some business. So he's got a nice parcel that I want to be on. And we are pretty close on our terms. But I'm like, well, what about the exclusive? Does Chick-fil-A have an exclusive? Well, yeah, they've got an exclusive. 
Well, how much chicken can we sell? Because we sell a lot of chicken. We've got our chicken sandwiches, our spicy chicken nuggets, our salads, and we don't want our hands tied down the road um, if some, you know, if we want to go 50-50 with chicken and burgers. So whatever it may be. And um, so we came to the point, and actually, because of the relationships that we have in the industry, I actually called the head of real estate for the West Coast, had the conversation with them. He would love to have us there, but he has to speak to all, all the Chick-fil-A's are separate operators. And so it's a, it's a constant battle with, you know, when we can coexist and when we can't. So exclusives are very important to pre protect your business long-term. Um, and we didn't make a deal, but we will make another one soon. Um, and then co-tenancy, sometimes um, there's, a, the tenants will ask for a requirement of co-tenancy which if you take um, Topanga Village, for example, um, and if I took that pad, if I could have had that pad on the corner, and I say, but if it was a dark Toys R, if it was a dark box, like this Toys R Us went out, but my developer's telling me, oh, don't worry, there's a grocery store coming. So I might write my lease and say, I'll go here and I'll pay this rent, but you're promising me that this, co this tenant will come, and if they don't, then maybe my rent will go down until they do, or it, you can get very creative, but but you go into these shopping centers, you know, for the re, for the synergy for the retail synergy. So co tenancies can be very important. Um, you have to negotiate time for your contingencies. Um, these deals take a long time to do. Um, it could take it's about two years at this point from from finding the site, which takes a long time. And usually you're working on about six sites to get to one site because there's so much fallout. But um, to get to from I, signing a letter of intent to getting to a lease, to getting to an internal corporate approval, um, and then getting through the city. Um, so you we build in a contingency period, which gives us time to go out. We do feasibility studies. We go and say, you know, is this property are there any soil issues? Are we sure it can be for our use? So we have um, built-in periods to investigate. We have built-in periods to permit through the city. We have to do plans, you know, get the plans permitted. And then we need a whole nother period to build. Um, so that's all built into this letter of intent. Um, we have something called landlord's work. What's the landlord doing for us? You know, if it's a shopping center, typically the landlord's going to deliver what we call all off sites or, you know, the access points and kind of um, anything going around the shopping center, utilities to the project. And then um, um, uh, what are they doing on site, on the actual premises? Are they paving? Are they striping the, the parking lots for you? Um, are they providing the access drives? So you get very um, particular with, and that there is a whole exhibit just for um, landlord's work. Um, and is there a tenant improvement allowance? Um, that would be when a landlord's giving you money to build your, your building. And then when they give you money, it's all a math equation. It's, you know, he's, uh, our developers kind of charge us money or charge us more rent for that money. So depending on the size of the tenant, we typically, it depends on the size of the tenant. Sometimes we want, with our new book suit program, we like the TI and are willing to pay more rent for it. Um, there's one big thing that you have to negotiate is common area and who's doing the common area maintenance. Because in the common area, there's insurance involved because of cross access, there's um, cleanup, there's sweeping, there's repaving. And, and then who's managing the common area? Sometimes these landlords want to manage the fee because they have to pay the people to do all the work. So um, that's addressed. Um, assignment, which is something that, you know, you're doing a lease with me, um, but I want the right to assign if things change. So this, some of these things get, we try not to get into too much of a lease or to, into too many legalities in a letter of intent. We want the basics, but we've identified the big, issues that typically we know we can get to a deal if we can get through these items and come to agreement on a letter of intent. Um, so you address assignment, right to enter, it's just we can go inspect the property, real estate commissions, um, whose form are we using? We always use the tenant form. <laughs> um, 
and uh, signatures and then exhibits. So I I know that we did not provide this last time, although we let people know that we had it if we wanted it, and several people did request it. So um, hope, I think Hugo passed it along this time. So if there's any questions, let us know. Um, this is a slide I thought would be fun to include, um, mainly because we're talking about how many different options there are in the real estate industry. And I probably should pass this around our real estate advisory committee. And I mean, I think that this could go on and on, uh, but I just highlighted a few. I mean, you can think about ownership, developing, you could think about being an in-house leasing agent, like Parker Middleton jumped over to a big mall developer. He was an in-house leasing agent with Mace Rich. Um, then you've got the corporate side, the tenant side, which I've talked a lot about. Um, I started as a real estate coordinator. Um, so it wasn't real glamorous. Uh, there were real estate managers above me and they're like, great, now I have somebody to do all the grunt work, which is <laughs> create the packages, create the package, like what we sh went through with, with Irwin's um, development. When I got to Carl's, their package was like a binder for sites. And I looked at that and I knew enough that um, we had consolidated that thing. So I changed things in the department and kind of really jumped on it and did my research and investigation. And within six months, they actually decided to create a, a real estate manager training program. So I actually, uh, my mentor created a year long program that every chapter, every month was a separate thing we're gonna focus on. And I think that companies should be doing more of this. Um, I, they rely a lot on their people that are, you know, seasoned and have been there a long time because, you know, they, they know they can get the job done, but we need to be bringing more people in from the bench. And so it was a great opportunity. They they trained me for a year to become a real estate representative and went up to real estate manager. Um, and then, um, so that's, you know, just kind of the growth level. Um, but, you know, I, I chose not to go higher than where I am as a director. I've had offers to, you know, become... Uh, oversee an entire team and just based on my lifestyle um, being a mom with kids liking flexibility liking the opportunity to have uh, other real estate interests um, that kind of keep me balanced I chose I'm like I want to be the one in the trenches I like being a real estate director in the trenches I'll be your best producer but I don't want to have to have direct reports so it's all it all kind of depends on where you want to go our senior VP of development, um, it, he came from Yum, and um, he's been with us, oh, I want to say four years now, and he's younger than me, um, but he had one of those trajectories. He started in finance at Yum and um, came over uh, to us, and he's phenomenal, but that's the path that you know he chose. Our chief development officer is a female. Um, who oversees international operations and all of real estate development and construction. And she's younger than me, but her husband stays at home with kids. <laughs> so it's all about, you know, where you want to go with your career. Um, brokers, brokers associates, the brokers out there, we, you know, they, they can have great, great careers, make a ton of money with the right clients, with, you know, the right dedication. Um, so, you know, we could just, you can kind of look through this. It's, Anything from an architect, engineer, appraiser, city planner, expediter, lender, general contractor. And I can say that, you know, we, our real estate advisory committee has, um, how many people now? About 30. I want to say around 40. Around 40. Yeah. And every one of those individuals, then there's varying um, careers and career paths and um, I know every single one of them is open to speaking to every single one of you if you have an interest. And I don't know if we have kind of a resume basically of what everybody does, but um, it's, it's everything. It's very there's, there's, there's lenders, there's uh, apartment, apartment developers, there's industrial um, owners, developers, other brokers. So it, the amount of experience that we have in terms of the, the bench strength of, of React. Is phenomenal. I wish I had this opportunity to talk to 
people. In, yeah. At, at, at this one here, here, because quite frankly, there's so many different experiences and stories, um, and and value that you can uh, gain from just meeting and asking questions about properties and real estate. And, uh, it's you know, we're one of the we're we're in the best one of the best real estate markets in the world right sure. here mm -hmm. and the density is 18 and a half million people just still oh, yeah oh my god and then just the other thing is average store volume at mcdonald's is higher here than everywhere else but right that means there's more spending here so i mean there's 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 some great things you should take advantage of it network i would call everybody i would call partner i would call you know now i call all those people and just go get coffee and talk to them and, and ask them about their experience, what they like, what they don't like. And I think what Kathy said is exactly right. You gotta figure out the kind of niche that you wanna be. There's there's so many different ways that you can participate in real estate, whether it's through finance, whether it's through lending, entitlements, um, leasing, private equity, you know, debt, equity, um, you name it. You just gotta find the niche and what you wanna do. And you know, I've, I've, I think it's just a great career source because it really takes advantage of everything you need to get marketing finance. You need to understand construction entitlements. It exposes you to a lot of things, and every day is different. And that's mm -hmm. what I love about it. Every deal is different, and every day is different, mm -hmm. and it's fun. It's fun. Yeah. That's the big secret behind it. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. It really is. Um, I mean, if you've got passion for it, and like you can see from Erwin, from me, from the, the three people that we saw, had the spotlight on, I mean, they're passionate about what they do. They love it. Um, and think about this. I mean, just, just real estate itself. Everybody needs to do this. We're using real estate right now. We're going to go home and do this. You're here, you work in real estate. Okay. You can affect people's, you can affect the economy of a neighborhood by developing a project and that lasts. And the ripple effects of employment, sales tax, mm -hmm. job creation, all these different things that are benefits. And, you know, I probably can't hear the same thing as me. They're probably one of the most, what I love was driving by a site that I worked on and go, Wow, it's it's performing well and it's like an asset to the community. And that's powerful. There's sustainability, there's there's data, uh, there's I mean very consistent with our mission. And as far as the real estate advisory committee that's here now and the offerings, as far as um, the panels and the career days and everybody I've talked to that's that has been in our business and it's like boy do i wish that we had that when we were here i mean it's a huge asset so again take advantage of it we've got some great professionals and one thing we didn't mention we don't talk about as much is the residential side of it which gerard Bismignano has seminar um which is also i'm sure really interesting to attend so another side of the real estate industry so um, so I just used, I just mentioned again, you know, a few, um, of my references, um,